great sultan i have bad news from dakkan go on my spy chief but be quick i don't want to keep the beautiful ladies of my harem waiting i can't wait to lay my hands on these new conquests i hear ravishing and well endowed infidel damsels from kanauj have arrived last night sultan malik mohammad naib has deserted his garrison and the esteemed office he's on his way to the capital what do you mean by deserted his garrison what about the troops under him sultan most of the troops were massacred and we found hacked off bodies along with the bags of tankas put on bullock carts coming towards the capital are you going to tell me what happened soon or do you want me to have you thrown off the fort walls sultan there have been uprisings all over telangana raichur and kampeli it might even be spreading to the ara samudra and mabar who is leading these uprisings sultan so far no leader has emerged they look very random and spontaneous you are a fool revolutions are anything but random get my army commander and have 8000 soldiers march to warangal and put these rabble rousers down wazir you don't look convinced speak your mind sultan i think sending the army might inflame the situation then what do you suggest instead a bitter pill sultan a bitter pill for us Hello listeners, welcome to Itihas, a Indic history podcast. And you're listening to episode 16 of the season Vijayanagara. This is the fifth installment in the Foundation series, and it's a special one to me personally because of what I went through to produce it for you wonderful people out there. While writing the Foundation series hasn't been in any way easy. I have to accept that this particular episode has been extremely challenging and frustrating to make. Normally I'm done writing and recording an episode at least a week ahead. This time though, I burned through a week experiencing the phenomenon of writer's block. Going back and forth with my research notes while staring into the blank wall for an extended period of time. If you recollect I promised in the show intro that whatever may I won't put out a content that will be dry straight on narration from some random history book putting you to sleep isn't my intention instead waking you up to our civilizational past is my only goal now to be able to even remotely succeed in that goal i have to be able to squeeze the nectar out of a deceptively looking fossilized flower garden of the past and then wrap it delicately into edible stories that my listeners can chew on slowly digest and internalize the insights embedded in those stories on their own terms humans are the only known animals that have the innate ability to tell stories our ability to weave stories communicate touch and tie each other and listeners like you half way around the world whom i've never met into a shared story is in itself an underappreciated aspect of ourselves it is our collective fiction memories and ideas that define us you all know a harari in his brilliant book and a global best seller the sapiens that was published in 2011 has this to say on this aspect good as far as we know only sapiens can talk about entire kinds of entities that they have never seen touched or smelled legends myths gods and religions appeared for the first time with the cognitive revolution many animals and human species could previously say careful a lion thanks to the cognitive revolution Homo sapiens acquired the ability to say 
the lion is the guardian spirit of our tribe. This ability to speak about fictions is the most unique feature of sapiens language. You could never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey heaven. Unquote. If you haven't read this classic book, you must. It's a beautiful gem. Now some listeners might be wondering where I am going with this and why a history podcast and a writer's blog would induce a discussion on storytelling. Retelling of any history is nothing but the act of storytelling. And the origins of Vijayanagara is a special kind of a story, a story within a story. It's an extremely tough nut to crack, a Gordian knot that is made up of threads of many mysteries. And to be able to tell that story, I had to first decide which thread to hold and where to begin the journey. It's like a maze with 10 different doors and only few of them will lead you out of it. First and foremost, understanding the place, backstory, narratives, characters, motives, recorded evidence at hand, and looking from multiple vantage points was very crucial for me to get a hold on this aspect. The problem is compounded by the fact that as over the last 120 years, more and more historians started looking into this aspect. For every layer they peeled, they raised many new questions instead of revealing the one definitive account that fits all the available evidence. There are especially a handful of bad narratives that have seeped into many books on Vijayanagara, including the Indian history books being used in the schools. It's extremely disconcerting to think that our children are being taught a mashup of fictional stories under the name of Indian history. The sheer incompetence of not just the state-appointed educational organizations that create the history syllabus, but also the nefarious agendas of some publishers, few ecosystem-anointed Western and Indian Indologists, who act as sole gatekeepers, while actively propagating flawed narratives is of a grave concern. Then there are many on both sides of the political aisles who use and abuse the origins and fall of Vijayanagara to peddle their own sad agendas. We notice one side practices intellectual dishonesty that results in whitewashing of facts and the other side suffers from a chronic case of intellectual laziness which then leads to a total ignorance in some aspects. Either way, people are deprived of real facts and are unable to form informed opinions or take pride in their own heritage. After months of painstakingly sifting through the recorded evidence spread across more than 35 to 40 different sources, written by many reputed contemporary chroniclers, modern historians and researchers, I was able to compare theories in most of them and zero in on three sources that help me connect most of the dots in the best possible way, from which I was able to glean some precious insights. The core sources I'll be using are Saklesbur Sri Kantaya's phenomenal work, Founders of Vijayanagara, published in 1938, Hoya Salawamsa by Paul Coelho, published in 1949, Early Vijayanagara by G.S. Dixit, published in 1988. In addition to these core sources, as a secondary line of reference, I've also used Rev. Henry Harris's Beginnings of Vijayanagara History, published in 1929, and a solid source like Epigraphica Karnataka series, published in late 19th century, as a reference for Vijayanagara and Hoysala period inscriptions. The inscriptions act as a cross-check mechanism for some troublesome accounts. Also, I have to give credit to V.K. Bandarkar's phenomenal paper published in 1941 AD on Kampili and Vijayanagara. In the process, to be fair, I'll present all the main prevailing narratives around this topic and explore each one in depth. And with my prologue out of the way, let's start our journey 
at the end of the episode titled From the Ashes of Kampili which drops us in the raging fires of the capital of Kampili as it fell to the Tughlaq armies after a tooth and nail battle in 1328 AD as we saw previously most of Kampili's royal harem either commit jahar in the raging fires or fall on their own sword before the enemy forces enter the fort and the king of Kampili and prince kumara rama lose their lives during their last stand in an epic showdown we saw in the previous episode how with the fall of yadavas kakatiyas pandyas and the tiny state of kampili by 1328 ad hoysalas and the last remaining power in the south we also saw how veera bahlala 3 decides to not take a risk by aiding the fugitive bahauddin garshas and avoids the wrath of tughlaqs on his kingdom and this is where the actual story starts by tacitly submitting to the tughlaqs and taking in limited damage in the form of huge tributes bahlala cleverly buys time to enable the hoysalas to regroup and bolster its defenses bahlala also realizes the constant danger of islamic forces right near his doorstep especially after he gets solid intelligence from deccan that the stain the tughlaqs had decided to wipe out all hindu kingdoms in the south for good so that there are no more rebellions in the future with the alarm bells finally ringing loud enough for bahlala he sets on an enterprise to redeem himself bahlala resolves to hunker down and strike the tughlaqs at an opportune moment as we saw in the last episode bahlala puts a new strategy in place and ends up creating a highly combustible atmosphere in the south and deccan by 1342 ad if you haven't listened to the last episode blood of the last hoysala please pause here listen to that first for better context and back story after the fall of hoysala's arch rival kampili bahlala convenes a very important war council of many powerful chiefs vassals and his own royal family let's now look at an excerpt from the famous muslim chronicler farishta's work the rise of muhammadan power in india composed in the 16th century bijapur court court this year 1344 ad krishna nayak son of ladder dev who lived near varangol went privately to bilal dev raja of karnatak and told that he had heard muhammadans who were numerous in deccan had formed the design to exterminate all the hindus and thus it was advisable to combine against them bilal dev convened a meeting of his kinsmen and resolved first to secure the forts of his country and then remove the seat of his government to the mountains krishna nayak promised on his part also when their plans were ripe to raise all the hindus of varangol and tulungana and put himself at their head unquote this excerpt from farishta's work is a really interesting one as it provides a lot of insight into many things in this it is pretty clear that farishta is giving an account of veera bhallala's council meeting with a powerful chieftain from telangana who gives him some crucial intelligence about the tughlaq plans for hindus we also see that farishta refers to the important convention of powerful men in the oyasala kingdom headed by bhallala and it's also evident that bhallala understands exactly what sort of danger the entire south and hindus are in we also see that telangana chieftain promises coordinated attacks on the tughlaqs in deccan when the time is right the only problem though in this excerpt is the year of this meeting that farishta had recorded this we know is wrong as bahlala was executed by the madurai sultanate in 1342 ad after his defeat in the battle of kannanur and koppam so there is no way this meeting happened in 1344 ad and instead it happened in 1328 ad right after the fall of kampili 
and to back that up as an evidence we have a beautiful inscription from chitaladurga taluk modern day chitaladurga district that's recorded in b lewis rice's work epigraphica carnatica volume 11 published in 1894 ad this inscription clearly details the names of all those who attended this grand convention called in by veera bahlala let's look at the excerpt to see who all were there quote in 1328 ad when the hoysana strong armed veera bahlala deva together with the champion at his side the strong armed bhimaraya the prince kathorahara the prince veera simha ragunatha the prince kalamecha the prince veera santa baicheya dananayaka kampuva who was the punisher of the famous madavaraya of udavara the great minister ballappa dananayaka the great minister singaya dananayaka were in the residence of the city of unnamale ruling the kingdom in peace and wisdom unquote this inscription is so precise about the date place and people it also fits into the overall timeline nicely farishta was off by 16 years in his account and it shows how he would have relied on unreliable sources for this account if we look at the inscription itself excluding bhallala we have three interesting names among the attendees first one is ballappa dananayaka and singaya dananayaka we saw these two in the earlier episode as important ministers of bhallala and the third interesting character is the prince kathorahara who is this prince kathorahara and why is he in such an important meeting this mysterious character as per shri kantaya is actually one of the future founders of vijayanagara he's a hariharaban shri kantaya has a very compelling theory to support this assertion we will revisit this in detail later with this we finally have the entry of a major character in both the vijayanagara and hoysala history at this point though i have to pause the flow of this storyline and take a detour to lead my listeners into another important story it is a story about the connection between kampeli and vijayanagara which needs to be explored first in depth to understand the origins of vijayanagara better this detour will take us back once again to the fall of kampeli in 1328 ad some listeners might recollect that in the episode from the ashes of kampeli i had mentioned that after the fortress of kumata finally fell most inside were slaughtered except six old men who were captured from the city and taken back to delhi as prisoners the historian venkata ramanayya in his work kampeli and vijayanagara published in 1929 talks at length about this he gives a fascinating account of events that transpired after the fall of kampeli he quotes contemporary sources like farishta ibn batuta and burni to present his version of events as he saw it let's look at a really important excerpt from ramanayya's work which is sourced from farishta's chronicles on kampeli quote when these nuptial feasts so abhorred of all were fulfilled they opened the gates of the fortress and their enemies forthwith entered and slew all of them except six old men who withdrew to a house these were made captive and were taken before the king of delhi and the king asked them who they were and how they had escaped and they told him who they were at which the king greatly rejoiced because one of them was the minister of the kingdom another the treasurer and the other were leading officers in it unquote the most important aspect of this excerpt is the six old men's detail one was a minister and another a treasury officer and the other four were officers of some rank in kampala deva's court or the army and the king of delhi as we know was a reigning tughlaq sultan we will now see why this six old men's detail is important or relevant to the origins of vijayanagara 
One of the several problems associated with the early history of Vijayanagara is the origin of the founders, Harihara and Bukka brothers. The experts and scholars on Vijayanagara are basically split into two factions. One supporting the theory that Harihara and Bukka were of Kannada descent and the other faction contended that the founders were of Telugu descent who happened to be the subordinates of the Kakatiyas of Varangal. And this split among the scholars is further inflamed by the people of Andhra, Telangana and Karnataka laying claim to the origin of the brothers and by transitive property laying claim to the glory of Vijayanagara. It's a sort of feedback loop wherein the prevailing cultural sentiments ended up hardening the stances taken by these native scholars. Their confirmation bias ends up contaminating their research and which then again is consumed by the people hardening their stances even further. Another factor is that so far no definitive inscription has been discovered that confirms the descent of the Sangama brothers. But I have to stress that by deduction of all the available recorded evidence and circumstantial evidence we can say with a fair degree of confidence that Sangama brothers belong to the Kannada origin. The theory of Telugu descent is an afterthought in my opinion and I will delve in depth why I think so in a little bit. The Kampeli Vijayanagara connection story or the narrative goes somewhat like this. And the story was first told by the 19th century Vijayanagara historian and a legend Robert Sewell in his classic work The Forgotten Empire. He says in that quote Soon after the capture of the brave Prataparudra II of Kakatiyas in 1323 AD, two brothers by names Harihara and Bukka, who were the treasurers of the Kakatiya king, fled from the kingdom and took service under the king of Kampeli. In Kampeli, the brothers rose to be minister and treasurer. Then in 1334 AD, Kampila Deva gave shelter to the Tughlaq fugitive, Bahauddin Gharshasp. and led the fall of Kampili. The Tughlaq Sultan that deputes his deputy, Malik Muhammad, to administer Kampili on his behalf. Malik at some point saw the people in that region rebelling against him. The Sultan had to replace him instead with prominent Hindus of Kampili to placate the region. Unquote. And these prominent Hindus, as per several, happened to be Harihara and Bukka brothers. who had been formerly the minister and treasurer of Kampili. Right off the bat, Sewell mentions the wrong year as we know Kampili fell in 1328 AD and not 1334 AD. Let's ignore that as it's a minor thing. Ever since this view was expressed by Robert Sewell, it has basically crept into almost all subsequent books and research by various scholars. Even eminent ones like K. A. Nilakanta Shastri. And from then on, many scholars have suggested a connection between the founders of Vijayanagara, who were said to be Telugus, Kakatiyas and the Kingdom of Kampili. Dr. Ramanaya in his work, Kampili and Vijayanagara, sanctifies this theory by showing three manuscripts, Rajakala Nirnaya, Sivatattva Ratnakar and Keladi Nirupa Vijaya. as an evidence for the Telugu origins of the Sangama brothers. And he also claims that this is a smoking gun proof of Vijayanagara's connection with both Kakatiyas and Kampili's royal families. Dr. Venkata Ramanaya goes even few steps further and claims that Harihara and Bukka had embraced Islam after the fall of Kampili and their capture by the Sultan's forces. and they were taken to Delhi as political prisoners. And after the Kampili region rose up against Sultan's deputy, the Sultan, like Robert Sewell indicated, had appointed the now Muslim Harihara as a governor of Kampili and Anigundi. And that it was only after 1344 AD that Harihara and Bukka brothers reconverted back to Hinduism and went to form the Vijayanagara Empire. Ramanaya uses the 14th century Muslim chronicler Ziauddin Burni's chronicles 
as a primary source for this account. This fantastical narrative by Ramanaya had invariably been picked up by later scholars and was repeated ad nauseum across many books. The reason I call this as a fantastical narrative is due to the fact that Ramanaya's theory has so many holes that if it was a ship it would have sunk right away. We will dissect his theory now. Let's start with his assertion that Harihara and Bukka were treasurers with Kakatiya's fled to Kampili and took up the same positions there. Ironically, death and destruction seems to follow these two treasurer brothers wherever they seem to go. First was Varangal and then Kampili. And for some strange reason, Ramanaya, in spite of being aware of the intense rivalry and enmity between the kingdoms of Kakatiya and Kampili, he doesn't wonder why and how on earth this Kampila Deva trusts these enemy fugitives and elevate them to one of the highest positions in his court. If this doesn't sound silly and highly improbable to you, then I don't know what will. Too much is going on here. It would have been more believable instead of Ramanaya had said these two brothers were professional mercenaries and whose martial skills were in high demand. This is not out of place in 14th century Deccan at all. But Ramanaya for some reason doesn't take such a low-hanging fruit and instead chooses to stick to this treasury officer or tax accountant nonsense. Next reason why Ramanaya's theory is unsound is the three manuscripts he bases his research on are not contemporary to Harihara's period. These manuscripts were all published no sooner than 16th and 17th centuries. Especially the manuscript Kailad in Europe of Vijaya by Lingana Kavi was written sometime between 1763 and 1808 AD. And not to mention Kampili's official court language was Kannada, not Telugu. So that puts it almost 435 years after the fall of Kampili. And most importantly, all of these manuscripts were written during the era of Tulava and Aravidu dynasties. Needless to say, both of these royal dynasties of Vijayanagara had a massive soft corner for Telugu language. Sri Krishna Devaraya was well known to have encouraged and patronized Telugu literature like none other. In coming to the Aravidu dynasty, they had every motive to perpetuate the Telugu origin theory as Aravidus themselves claimed Telugu descent. If you remember from the past episodes, Aravidus had their power base in proper Telugu country and their ancestors too had links to erstwhile Chalukyas. So obviously most poets and composers would have gone to great lengths to curry favours from both these dynasties and lending credence generously to a weak Telugu origin theory. And gradually this theory along with many other legends took hold in the minds of the people of that era. They seeped into contemporary literature and historical discourses. So it is worth stressing the fact that there is no epigraphical evidence to support the Telugu origin theory and for all practical purposes it's a well-crafted propaganda by the 16th and 17th century dynasties. Finally, the biggest problem with Ramanaya's theory is his claim of Harihara and Bukka's conversion to Islam and then Harihara becoming a proxy governor on behalf of Tughlaqs for Kampili region, which he anchors on Burni's account, which we will see now. Quote, A revolt broke out among the Hindus at Arangal. Kanyanayaka had gathered strength in the country. Malik Makbul, the Nayab Bazir, fled to Delhi, and the Hindus took possession of Arangal which was then entirely lost. About the same time, one of the relations of Kanyanayaka, whom the Sultan had sent to Kampala, apostatized from Islam and stirred up a revolt. The land of Kampala also was thus lost and fell into the hands of Hindus." Unquote. 
Farishta also refers to Ziauddin Barni's account that we just saw in his chronicles. This again shows how easy it is for an account to innocently sneak into other sources and contaminate them. Either way, the inference that can be drawn from the account supplied by Dr. Ramanaya is that between 1327 to 1336 AD, for a period of 10 years, Harihara and his brothers were Muslims. And it was in 1336 AD that they apostatized and reconverted back to Hinduism. While I have to accept that there were many cases indeed of Hindu rulers converting to Islam either to save their thrones or their lives. In this particular case though there is no evidence other than these Muslim chronicles talking about Sangama brothers and Maase converting to Islam then becoming apostates by reconverting to Hinduism sometime later. It certainly beats anyone's imagination to propose such a theory and then confirming it in writings like Ramanaya did with the help of dubious sources. This chameleon like change of religion by Harihara and his brothers is really difficult to believe. Especially when the first founder of Vijayanagara, Harihara, is regarded as a champion and defender of Hinduism. During a time when Hindus were under a genocidal siege all across India. So, one must ask an important question here. Would Harihara and his brothers go over to the fold of these very invaders just to be appointed governors or ministers once again and not just lose all face but also become public enemies number 1 for siding with the invaders so they had lot more to lose than gain by doing this these founders were known to have professed to be the protectors of varnashrama dharma cows and brahmins and were supposedly the loyal dependents of the brave king prataparudra of kakatiyas if we assume that claim for a second the same prataparudra who had been destroyed by the islamic invaders for his refusal to embrace islam considering how popular prataparudra was it is worth thinking if at all people would have embraced harihara and bukka after they converting to islam and then allowing them to reconvert back to hinduism and start an hindu empire another important question to ask would be would vidyaranya of the renowned sringeri mata the well known and legendary guru of the vijayanagara founders their guide philosopher have associated himself with them in spite of knowing that they had been lechas for 10 years engaging themselves in cow slaughter eating beef and ruling in the name of genocidal invaders who were hell bent on destroying the kafirs and infidels of the land when one looks at this through the lenses of the 14th century india instead of looking at it through our post truth and post modern lenses it becomes easy to understand that the hindu society back then would not have tolerated such people or even allowed such a reconversion to take place at that time irrespective of what later legends say this theory is on a really weak footing in my opinion case in point we have a famous example of the great chhatrapati shivaji maharaj himself who was refused coronation initially by the court priest on the grounds that he wasn't technically a kshatriya then there was a case of shivaji's own brother in law baja ji rao nayak nimbalkar who had become a muslim under the pressure of Bijapur's Adil Shah in the 17th century. And it's well recorded how Baja Ji was expelled from his community and seen as a mlecha for a long time until Shivaji brought him back into the fold after a special reconversion ceremony. If it was so sensitive and a taboo or intolerable in the 17th century, it would have been near impossible for 14th century sangama brothers to have done these religious somersaults and then be appointed by the head of shringeri matha as a defenders of sanatana dharma in such troubled times we will revisit this touchy aspect in the next episode once again and i will show you how it's a well crafted myth 
Now let us look at an excerpt from the 16th century Portuguese traveler Fernão Nunes's Chronicles. Quote, In the meanwhile, taking advantage of the absence of the sultan, the people revolted, and the sultan was forced on the advice of his counselors to send for the six men he held captive. Finding no near relative, the late king of Bisanaga among them, he appointed one among them who had been a minister formerly as the king of the troublesome territory. He was not related by blood to the kings, but only was a principal judge. The six men came to Nagundi and Devrao, the minister who had been now appointed king, ruled there and strove to pacify the people and those who had revolted." Unquote. Here we see the same six old men detail being repeated. And we also see a new name called Devrao. Who is this Devrao? It basically is a Portuguese mutation of the Indian name Devaraya. Who is this Devaraya? But again there is no mention of Harihara or Bukka. Was this Devaraya Harihara or was it Veerabhallala Devaraya? But Ramanaya assumes this is Harihara. And we will see shortly why that's not possible. B.K. Bhandarkar in his 1941 research paper on Kampili and Vijayanagara thinks that this was a minister by name Devaya in Kampili's court whose assistance the Sultan took to exorcise the ghost of Kampili's Kumara Rama's head which was hung on the walls of Sultan's fort. So you see the lands of 14th century Deccan were full of tales and legends of Kampili and its popular kings who fought to death bravely against the Tughlaqs. But the veteran Kannada historian Sri Kantaya has another theory about this mysterious character of Deirao, which we will explore in the next episode. Now let's look at another interesting excerpt from the chronicles of the 14th century Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta. He is usually known as one of the most reliable chroniclers. Quote, King Kampila was however defeated. His capital was destroyed and 11 sons of the Raya were made prisoners and carried to the Sultan, who made them all Muslims. The Sultan made them Amirs and treated them with great honor. Of these brothers, I saw near the Sultan Nasir Bhaktiyar and the keeper of the seals. His name was Abu Muslim and we were companions and friends." Unquote. Most striking aspect of this account is that it is a first-hand witness account and not hearsay. The detail of our interest though is the reference to the 11 sons of Kampila Devaraya who were captured and converted to Islam. Again, no reference to Harihara and Bukka or the six old men. Why would have Ibn Battuta miss such crucial details? He didn't because it mostly didn't happen. It's as simple as that. His accounts mostly weren't contaminated like the rest of the accounts that came long after. And Ibn Battuta probably just wrote what he actually knew was right or confirmed. And Ibn Battuta is the only chronicler who was actually very close to the action of the 14th century and is also the only one who talks about the 11 sons of Kampila Deva who were made captive after the fall of Kampili. Neither Farishta, Barni nor Nanjunda Kavi make any reference to this important detail. So at this point, few things are crystal clear when it comes to the two main narratives around the founders being of Telugu descent and the other narrative being the founders having converted to Islam and then reconverting back to Hinduism. Most of these are probably false and inaccurate and for all practical purposes they are mere propaganda. I personally think this propaganda was a handy work of the Bijapuri court chroniclers who were pumping out this conversion theory as a part of psychological warfare against the declining Vijayanagara empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. We will also dispel another narrative of Ramanaya 
in which he claims that the father of the Vijayanagara founders, Sangama, was a blood relative of Kampiladeva. He points to a remote reference to a Bhava Sangama in Kampili royalty as a proof of this connection. The inference being the Sangama of Kampili was a brother-in-law of Kumara Rama, Crown Prince of Kampili, who was married to his sister. And we know that Kumara Rama had two sisters by names Maramma and Singamma. And we also know that the Vijayanagara Sangamma's wives' names were Kamambika, Gaurambika and Malambika. So right there we can see it's a case of mistaken identity. And the Kampali Sangamma is not the same as Vijayanagara Sangamma. And hence there is no whatsoever connection between Kampali and Vijayanagara bloodlines. What mostly happened was the later chroniclers knew that the father of the founders was a Sangama and they were looking for that name in contemporary literature and later works and they ended up finding one Sangama in Kampili's nobility who was then mistaken as Harihara's father Sangama. With this name found, a relation was conveniently established, a non-existent one that is. Later scholars got busy shaping and reshaping the evidence at hand such that it fits their theories, instead of doing it the other way round. Once again, the pedigree of the real Sangama is fully confirmed by the Sangur inscription of Devaraya 1, dated to 1407 AD, in which it mentions that the founder's father, Sangama, was a son of a Baichavagade, a fully Kannada sounding name and nowhere close to Telugu. Finally, let's come to the detail of the six old men made captive after the fall of Kampili, which Ramanaya claims were the Sangama brothers. First of all, there were only five Sangama brothers, not six. And most importantly, in 1328 AD, the Sangama brothers were at most in their late 30s or early 40s. They don't fit any sane definition of old. I personally am of the opinion that these six men were part fiction and part reality. Since all the accounts cannot be entirely wrong, there would have been indeed few local individuals who were empowered by the Delhi Sultan to placate the natives of the region who were now rebelling. Now how many were they exactly is a pure speculation, as none of the accounts actually mention their names. So finally, we come to the main question, who were the Sangamas after all? The first Vijayanagara dynasty is named as Sangama, after the name of their father Sangama, or also known as Sangameshwara. In total, Sangama had five sons, Harihara, Bukka, Kampa, Marappa and Mudappa, the eldest being Harihara and the youngest being Mudappa. But the most prominent of these brothers were Harihara and Bukka, who went on to launch the first Vijayanagara dynasty and in the process inaugurated a glorious Hindu empire's foundation. So who was the character Sangama after all? And what were his own origins? The answer to this question has been one of the most sought after one in Vijayanagara studies till date. Almost every notable scholar in Vijayanagara studies has taken a stab at answering this. Along with the theories around the rise of Sangama brothers from obscurity. Or at least that's how it's portrayed in many narratives. Even today, there are legends abound of two mysterious Telugu converts who out of blue like a thunderbolt took hold of entire south and built a glorious city at an unbelievable pace. Again, how did Harihara and Bukka end up forging such a powerful empire during a time when Deccan was sandwiched between powerful forces? What role did the remaining five brothers play? If Sangama brothers were of Kannada descent, then what was their connection with Oysalas? Was there one? What role did Sangamas play in the fall of Hoysalas? Were Sangamas enemies of Veera Bhallala? What was the relationship like between the Sangama brothers? 
what was the political situation in the south and deccan and india as such when harihara and bukka burst onto the scene out of nowhere some scholars like sri kantaya and henry harris have done a phenomenal job in their attempts to move the needle forward while cleaning up the muddled waters painstakingly they were like detectives solving a murder case instead of being just plain historians kudos to their contributions indeed when it comes to the origins aspect with this we will end the current episode in which we started unraveling the mystery behind the origins of the founders of vijayanagara we looked at the various theories and narratives around this aspect and debunked some in the process we are not done yet though there are still a lot of questions to be answered and we will look at many of these unanswered questions in the next episode in depth and follow the rise of sangamas i sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this episode and if you did please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you're listening a huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show and i hope to see you soon in the next episode till then this is narendra vikram your host and narrator signing off hope you have a great week ahead